so you ask in the same essay, uh, we're moving more towards the philosoph uh, philosophy and postmodernism, but you ask in the same essay, why has art of the 20th century poured its creative energies and cleverness into the trivial and self-proclaimed meaningness, meaninglessness? Mm -hmm. And I just said, when everything's the same, nothing matters. So can you explain the inherent meaninglessness of postmodern art and maybe draw a line between the aesthetics of this and the culture? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great, yeah, complicated and, uh, you know, absolutely important topic, right? Because you know, certainly for most people over the course of the last century, you know, who, uh, you know, who love culture, who love art, uh, you know, they're, they're slapped in the face with what's been going on in, in the high modernist and now postmodernist art world. And it really does strike them as a slap in the face, both aesthetically, but then also that intellectual puzzlement that we all go through. It's like, what the hell is, is going on? And uh, in, in many cases, they come with a benevolent naivete. You know, I, I've been told that this is great, this is important, and so I really do want to, to understand maybe there's some deficiency in me. So we do give it a lot of uh, a benefit of the doubt. I think to, it, to its credit, certainly uh, modernism and postmodernism in the art world, they are sounding important themes. Mm. I think that's inherent in, in art. I mean, we, we want art to have a, you know, just as we've been discussing, a, a sensuous impact on us, our, our eyes, our touch, our, our, even mm -hmm. our, our sense of smell and- this emotional uh, reaction. And, and sound, that's right. Uh, but then also, you know, instead of you know, it simply being a sensuous appeal, we, we know that art can push our emotional buttons deeply. You know, where we, we laugh out loud and we, we feel energized and need to get up and run around. And mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, we cry and we, we find ourselves sad for mm -hmm. a while or even crushed emotionally by an experience. And, and we think about it, you know, we, 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 you know, we, we uh, what, is, what is being said there? What does this make me think of? And we do find ourselves when we're in the presence of great art, thinking about all of the important things in our, in our lives, our important yeah. values and so on. So uh, modernism and postmodernism, I do think are continuous with that, but for various reasons, they are emphasizing the negative in, in all areas of life. Now, partly this I think is uh, because we have postmodernism, sorry, not postmodernism, I wanna save that one for a little bit that the, the early modernists were part of the modern world. And what happened in the modern world was a big rise in our analytic uh, attentiveness, scientific method. And one of the things that we start to do is break everything down to its constituent elements and then try to put it together again. And you do see this going on in 19th century art and art theory, where they're analyzing art. And they're saying all of the different elements of art uh, yeah, can we break it down to its constituent po components and see what's going on there? So if you're talking about painting, if you're talking about line and light and shadow and color and perspective and all of the elements. Mm. And uh, you know, just as scientists will break things down to its constituent parts to, to see how it all works, you can see the art theorists and the artists doing all of that. And so part of what happened was art went in a very reductionistic direction, almost as a kind of a scientific experiment. So I don't know, you might uh, you know, imagine you know, the early brain scientists, you know, they, they take off the top of someone's head <laughs> and, and then they just, you know, they, they poke here and say, all right, what happens if we poke this part of the brain? Or what happens if we take out this part of the brain? Can mm -hmm. the person still think? And mm -hmm. there's a similar or, or feel or sense. And there's a similar thing going on in the art world where we say, well, suppose we get rid of the third dimensional perspective and we just have arrays of colors and lines on a two dimensional surface. Mm -hmm. Is this still art? Or right. what if we get rid of the color differentiation? Is it still art? Right. And what if we get rid of uh, any perceptual content and we just have an idea? Is it art? Can we get any sort of emotional reactions without really communicating any representational concept, yes or no. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole reductionistic strain that's going on in art where they're just taking art apart and seeing, seeing what's left. Okay. And uh, you know, part of the, the, the ending nihilism does seem to be that they got after a few decades of this to the point where we kind of stripped everything away from art and we're not left with anything. So art comes to seem kind of empty. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that I think is one, one strain. 
but it looks like you need to say something. So well, I go just, ahead and jump in. I, I, I wonder if it necessarily uh, does have to be bad when you use the reductionist argument and just strip away elements of art because right. theoretically I, I you know i'm not sure if there's great examples of it but theoretically there still can be really good art produced that can produce an emotional reaction absolutely absolutely yeah. um I, and like i said i can't think of any examples um but yeah perhaps you know I, the question would be like with <laughs> all the reductionists why isn't there and why isn't art being produced from this reduction that does cause an emotional reaction? Like, right. Yeah. Well, part of it is uh, one of the experiments was to say that art traditionally has been evoking emotions, but so let's try to strip away all of the emotions and just make everything very cool and uh, valueless and then see if it still is, still is, is, is art. And at most what you're then ending up with is either you just have some idea uh, that you can kind of figure out what the idea is, but it's not meant to cause any emotional reaction in you, mm -hmm. or you go the other way and you're just left with some, some colors that may or may not be pleasing to your eyes, but it doesn't mm -hmm. evoke any deeper emotions right, and so on. No, but you're right. Uh, you know, any of these scientific experiments, if we say that that's what's going on, they can be valuable. Mm -hmm. And I, I think part of artistic training uh, uh, throughout the centuries has been analytical uh, not as ruthlessly as was engaged in in the modernistic project, but to say as part of your training, we do take art apart and you work on different elements and then you try yeah. the different combinations and so on. But what, what is different about the reductionist argument is uh, that rather than say we're taking everything apart so that we can better understand how to put it together yeah. to have art that is integrated, that is a sensuous appeal, an emotional appeal, and mm -hmm. an intellectual appeal, that, uh, and this is where you have to start doing a little mind reading where you're doing the reduction uh, for analytical purposes, but you're not really that interested in putting things back together. Mm -hmm. So that nihilistic destructiveness starts to come out where you just enjoy the, uh, the breaking things down. Yes. Now, I think another important, absolutely important part of the art though is not at all kind of as an analytic experiment, but as a, as a, kind of strong pessimism you know if we think you're an artist and you're attracted to art because you uh, you, you you want to experience the world sensuously strongly mm -hmm. you want to have strong emotional reactions you want to really feel intellectually engaged like you are you're figuring things out yeah uh, and so if that is the prototypical uh, 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 motivation right for someone to come to be an artist the question then is going to be what happens if you are a passionate and thoughtful person, but what you come to believe and feel is that the negative is the dominant and truest understanding of the world and you want to express that in your art. So here I think the dates start to become important because if you uh, look at standard art history, and I think this is right, They'll say that, you know, the big break really is happening in art history around the turn of the 20th century. And by the big break, you mean move towards the postmodern art? Now, toward modernist art. Postmodernism yeah. is going to be a little bit later. So you say, you know, there's uh, all kinds of realism and impressionism and so forth that are dominant in the late 1800s. So mm -hmm. Monet, Manet, and, 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 and others. Uh, but the big breaks start to occur with someone like uh, Edvard Munch, Mm -hmm. you know, in, the, in the late 1890s and the then early Brock and Picasso in the in the early part of the 20th century. So, and then Marcel Duchamp is a young man and de Kooning is in that area and so on. So if you just take that kind of generation immediately before World War I, that generation there, mm -hmm. but then you ask what's going on in the, the, the world of ideas and culture at that time. And it's, uh, it's pretty dark stuff that's going on. I mean, yeah. you do have uh, a large number of people who are uh, impacted by, say, Darwin's origin of species. And so this idea that human beings just might be these instinctual animals, and, uh, right? and, yeah. and it's all nature red in tooth yeah. and claw. And Friedrich Nietzsche is, uh, you know, the, the, the leading philosopher that all of the exciting young people are reading. And mm -hmm. he's telling us that God is dead and we're in this era of nihilism and all of these fairy tales are just myths. Uh, and, and we're surrounded by mediocrity, mediocrities mm -hmm. and we're in a slave culture and so on. You've got uh, scientists arguing that entropy 
and the second law of thermodynamics. And I'm not saying that these are all the, the right interpretations sure, of all sure. of these things, but you, know, you can say that you know entropy means that the the universe is 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 winding down toward a nothing, and it's just going to be this ultimate heat death of the mm -hmm. universe. And you've got <laughs> Sigmund Freud coming along yeah. saying that we're all just these you know smutty animals that want to you know rape and enslave each other and have sex with our mothers yeah. and, and and so forth. And you got Marx talking about alienation and and oppression You're and quite exploitation. In, painting quite the picture of a exactly that's mood. right. But these are all the dominant yeah, these are the dominant cultures. So if you're yeah. a sensitive, thoughtful, passionate person growing up in this time, and, mm -hmm. and even if you're not like, you know, a PhD, you know, a history or philosophy type student, you're, you're just an, a very sensitive intellectual person and you're attracted to the arts, you're going to soak it all up. Yeah. And that's what artists do. You soak it all up and then you run it through your personal filters mm -hmm. and then you want to externalize it. So then the question is going to be, you know, are we going to be, you know, doing pretty Monet light studies about these benevolent gardens and, you know, life is kind of this lovely mm -hmm. garden, right? Or are we going to be talking about building, you know, magnificent cathedrals to the sky that better enable us, say, to point toward the heavens and perhaps even toward God? Like big shift and away from religious seems for sure. That's right. So all of that's going to seem like crap. All of that's going to seem right, pointless. So if you really feel that life is, is, is nasty, it's brutal, it's irrational, that we're mm -hmm. all in conflict with each other and we're just killing and we're all just going to be dead in a box in the ground. Nothing matters. Well, nothing mm -hmm. matters ultimately. Mm -hmm. And then how do you express that in your art? Sure. And you're not going to have beautiful colors. You're not going to be, you're, you're going to be looking for the most disturbing emotions that yeah. you can point to. Right? And the themes, to the extent that you have themes, have to be ones that people uh, get people to, to, to feel confused, to feel alienated, and to think that this is really pointless as, a, mm -hmm. as an exercise. So that break, I think, explains a lot of the content direction of, uh, of early modernism. I just love, I hate to interject, but I just love that analysis of how art literally can reflect culture and the mood. You know, that's yeah. such a tangible that's, way of looking. I'm thinking of right. Monk's Scream, I'm thinking of Picasso paintings, Dali paintings, like it's, it, it, it is fantastic but it's what the hell's going on, you know? That's right. And these guys are extraordinarily creative mm. at externalizing you know, what's going on in there. Yeah. So yeah, you do, you, you go into Dali's world and it, it is surreal in the sense of, yeah. it's just Amazing. weird, freaky dreams and you have no <laughs> idea what weird, freaky yeah. dreams, uh, and maybe reality just is one big, weird, freaky, freaky uh -huh. dream. Right? Uh -huh. And you look at Picasso and, and you go into Picasso and it's, you know, all of these empty eyes and there's no glimmer of intelligence in, sure. in, in all of those. And they're all fractured. And yeah. yeah, that's right. So you feel it and you Details think. Details are taken away. Like you're just, yeah, a uh, lot of that. you're a box. Yeah. Yeah. Did you want to make a point quickly moving over to the postmodern? Yes. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, my reading is that uh, a lot of these modernist themes, and there's lots of substrains that we can get into, are working themselves out. You know, obviously, uh, the art world was largely interrupted by World War I, mm -hmm. took a hit during the Depression, World War II. But you do see a lot of variations going on in the 30s and 40s and 50s uh, and so on. Also, interestingly, there's a strange detour uh, by much of the Western art community toward a kind of social realism and socialist realism. You know, as, as then they stopped being quite so uh, contentless and, and nihilistic and they got captured by the idea that what was going on in the Soviet Union was this great experiment in socialism and so we do need to give artistic props to that and so mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're doing a lot more realistic kind of art but trying to prop up the values of a kind of a, some sort of left leaning yep. atmosphere as well but then that got abandoned uh, by the time we get to the 50s. So what happens though in the, by the time we get to postmodernism is I think a little bit more ruthless because the modernists, when you push them, they will say things like, you know, I'm, I am saying stuff about reality. Mm -hmm. I am saying something about the human condition, that this is what it's like to be a human being in this alienated world. And I am saying things like, you know, man is a wolf to man and there is all of this exploitation. So we still have some 
values, even if they are negative values. And we still have some commentary on the nature of reality and the nature of, of human beings. Mm. But what if you start to become very skeptical that we can even make statements about what reality is, or that there is such a thing as human nature and the human condition, or that there really are objective values that we think are being violated and you're angry about that and you want to say something about that. If you're very skeptical and very relativistic, you're going to start backing away from, from all of that. Mm. And that's what starts to happen in the 1950s and the 1960s where we say, we, we have no idea what reality is like. All we have is these subjective narratives that, uh, that each of us constructs or that is constructed in us by various social forces that are operating on us. And we're all just vehicles uh, through which we are channeling various kinds of uh, kinds of social social energy. And there are no universal values. There are no objective values. Um, so if I'm an artist then and I believe all of that, then what am I going to do? And at that point, you can't be making statements about reality, about the human condition, or about objective values. It has to be just some sort of subjective or group subjective uh, mm. kind of content. So what typically the, uh, the postmoderns do on the content side is uh, they will, will uh, then start to say, the only kind of reality that we can talk about is social reality, not nature, not God, right, and so forth. And we're never going to make claims, sorry? Because everything's contextual. Uh, well, even more than contextual, it's socially constructed contextual. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's a, you know, uh, yeah, you know, I can be contextual and say, you know, here's my context. You know, the, I'm in this room, and the room is a real place, and there's a painting behind me, and mm -hmm. it's a real painting, and I'm real, and my computer is real, and you're real. But this is our little intellectual context right now. Right. But if I want to be a social constructionist, I want to argue that none of those things have a, an independent objective existence apart from what we make of it socially. So we start only doing social commentary. We don't talk about God, nature, human nature, and so forth. But we also, we always do it from a social uh, group perspective. So I'm not speaking as a human being or expecting to communicate to you as a human being. If I'm an artist, then I have to be a white guy or an Anglo-Saxon white guy making an Anglo-Saxon white guy comment about something. So what you do find, and this is a part of the distinctive move into postmodernism, is that all of the artists are no longer artists. They are always a hyphenated artist. I'm a woman artist. I'm a gay artist. I am a Hispanic, right, um, Jewish, right, whatever. Yeah, and that's my value. And that's right. Yep. And all of it is that social narrowness. And that's all that I can say. And then part of it also lends to say, if you're not in my group, I can't talk to you and you will not understand my art mm. because you have a different social reality that has been constructed in you. So you start to then have, well, this would be the pejorative term, a ghettoization of art. Okay. And then of course, you know, if you think that uh, uh, there still is a kind of exploitation that's going on, the art is going to be very angry it's my group against your group. And right. so you have all kinds of protest art. And, and then, you know, politics, I think, does have a legitimate place in art. But, you know, uh, that's all you're left with is social realities. It's adversarial and you're just making political comments. Mm -hmm. And so postmodernism starts to work that territory. Perhaps what they end up producing is only, going back to the reductionist argument, what they end up producing is only what w is within their socially contextualized like range of possibility because they couldn't yes. borrow other people's uh, socially contextualized uh, ranges to put into their art as well. And therefore yes. like the potential of the art is just immediately handicapped because it can't enter yes. all these other ranges yes. like, That's right. like that. Well, yep. That's saying um, I did have a question, perhaps this one is better saying that Dali um, and Picasso represented uh, their age when you have a, a urinal being placed as an art exhibition, what does that say about this age? Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to weaken your claim just a little bit. You know, in yeah. part, they are representing their age, but I think they are representing some currents within their age. I don't want to 
say that they're speaking for the whole sure. of the early 20th century because there's all sorts of amazing stuff that's going on right in the in the 20th century. I mean, we have, you know, by the end of the, the 19th century, we've largely eliminated slavery in uh, the civilized parts of the world and are working on the, the, the other parts. And that's a great moral accomplishment. And women who have been forever second and third class citizens are now getting going to higher education and voting universally and starting business. So that's an amazing progress story. Yeah, there is the kind of the brutality of, uh, of communism and Nazism when we're fighting the wars. But the, you know, the democratic republics, the liberal societies, they do get their act together and they do win those wars and mm. they are creating still a lot of a lot of free space. And of course, there's all the stuff that's going on in technology, uh, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the radio, television, everybody being able to get a car and so forth. So I don't want to say that these surrealists and uh, fragmenting the universe into cubism, they're speaking for their age. They're speaking right. for a part of, part sure, of their sure. age and so on. Okay, so, so with that, what that comment said. The other thing is that they're not only representing their age, but they're also making their age. So, uh, and this is part of what people who are at the forefront of culture do. Okay. Uh, that in, 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 not in all cases, but in many cases, it really is a few uh, elite individuals right, within mm -hmm. various movements who have a, a, a creative originality and a force of personality and perhaps some marketing savvy sure. who, 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 who they take culture in a certain direction and the rest of us follow follow along. So okay. they're representing part of culture, but they're also making culture and taking it in a direction that it didn't necessarily have to go. So, but, uh, but that, that's no, just all by way of preamble for the urinal, but yeah, let yeah. me uh, we'll remember the urinal, and, but jump in, <laughs> go ahead. No, no, um, please continue, continue. I, I, what I was going to say was going to take us away from the urinal. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> Which, <laughs> so yeah, Duchamp, uh, you know, he's a brilliant guy. He was a, you know, a chess master and, uh, and what's going on in his art is he, he's enjoying playing intellectual games with us, mm -hmm. but he is going in the direction of, of, uh, you know, being able to see two or three steps ahead of everyone else as a great chess player does and see where the trend lines in art are going and then finding a clever way to say you know, where we are now, if we go further down this road, this is where we're going to end up. We're mm -hmm. going to end up with the urinal. <laughs> so, um, and, it, and it is kind of interesting that, you know, a century later when, I think it was the BBC, they pulled uh, something like a thousand working artists and they said- Century you know, later them, being what year? Uh, this is in the early 2000s now. Okay. So it's about a decade ago. So they're, they're doing one of those respect, retrospectives on the 20th century. And the question they're asking is, over the course of the last 100 years, who do you think was the most important artist and the most influential on your own approach to, to, to art? Mm -hmm. And uh, Picasso was number two on the yeah. survey list. Duchamp, number one. He's number one, wow. He was number one. And that's interesting because urinal was displayed, uh, his, his label for it was fountain. <laughs> but it was displayed in, in uh, yeah. 1917. Uh -huh. So uh, that then is to say a century later, he is still the dominant person. Mm. And he's a kind of conceptualist. And so what we then have to do is we have to see this object as a symbol for certain abstract ideas that uh, Lee wants to, wants to communicate. So, mm. uh, so I'll say a few things about it. I mean, one is to say, uh, you think of an artist and what's your stereotype of what an artist? And you say, well, an artist is someone who creates something himself or herself and then goes ahead and makes it. Okay. Well, if we're playing this reductionist game and we're going after creating and originality and making on the artist side and we strip all of that away, mm. then what are you left with? Well, you don't have an artist as a maker. Duchamp didn't make it. Instead, all he did was he went down to a plumbing store and bought it. Somebody else made it. Yeah. As a mass produced thing. It was the mass produced, it. yeah. Yeah, so his entire contribution to the process is laying out some money for it and then transporting it to a place and saying, let's call this art. Mm. So that then is to say something very negative about the artist. 
The artist is not this creator, innovator, maker person. Sure. Okay, right. Uh, we also, uh, when we think about art, if we think about the, the products of art, we typically treat them with a certain amount of reverence. Right? When we clean them, we're, we're, we're very careful. Right? Mm -hmm. we, sometimes we put them behind protective screens. We shield them from the light. They occupy prominent they places are, in, within. Yes, house. that's right. And we'll put them in museums or art galleries with security. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, uh, you know, they, they will say that they now have some intrinsic value and worth. And mm -hmm. in many cases, we're, we're, we're making them with special art products and media, marble, okay. you know, the best, most purest marble from Carrara, Italy, yeah. uh, right, and so forth. So if we then say that, you know, say a statue by Michelangelo made from with Carrara marble uh, and the enormous intrinsic as well as artistic and symbolic and cultural value that it has, well, now we juxtapose that with the urinal. And what is the urinal, right? Well, it's you know, perhaps some clay cheap and some porcelain, yeah. cheap materials, just kind of mass produced in some factory in New Jersey and uh, no you know, mopped around and making it. Uh, sorry? No technical skill goes into creating yeah, it. Well, there is actually quite a bit of technical skill, but at, at a certain point it's all automated. Not, not and so compared to a just, Michelangelo. Yeah, more or less, yeah, robotically made. Yeah. So this is not Carrara marble, right? It's clay and some porcelain. It's not a, an individually unique thing. It's just this mass produced, you know, there's thousands and thousands of mm -hmm. them, right? All around the world. And so uh, are art objects special, unique? And the answer here again is a negative one. No, it's not, mm. nothing special. And then if you go from the artist to the artistic product to the, the other key part of the art, and that's the consumer of the art or the person who experiences the art. And then our expectations are that when we are in front of a, a work of art or it's surrounding us, that we're going to have a certain sensuous, emotional, intellectual experience. And if we are hopeful about art, we want it to be a positive one. We want us to make it feel, you know, we're glad that we're in the world and happy to be alive and maybe mm -hmm. energized to do, uh, to, to do various things, to, you know, just, uh, you know, to love our friends and family a little more and be more, right, and so forth. So, but what then is the experience you have when you are confronted with the urinal? Right. So you go in and you look at it and you recognize it. That's a urinal. Mm -hmm. And you know, what's a urinal for? And we say yeah. things like you the know, antithesis of beauty and art and exactly, happiness. Exactly, that's right. So, so this is something that men urinate on. Mm. Right? Now, if that's art, and you're choosing something that men urinate on mm -hmm. as your artwork, then what are you saying about art? You're yeah, saying it's the absolute bottom. Absolutely, anything can be art. That's and therefore, right. Well, it's partly yeah, that, loses but this value. is not, yeah, this is not just anything, even though, I mean, when sort of buy something, he could have bought a kitchen sink, mm. right? And said, here's my work of art, a kitchen sink, right? Sure. He chose a urinal, right? And so if a urinal is art and urinals are things that you piss on, then what he is saying is piss on art. Mm -hmm. And that's his intellectual theme. And that's where we're going, right? If everything yeah. is negative, then we're not creating beautiful, ennobling things. And, then, and you get to the point when, if you think about yourself as a nihilist, you know, there are burn it down nihilists, mm -hmm. but there are also nihilists who just want to shit on everything and nihilists who just want to piss on everything. Oh. And what we have here exactly is a thematic statement by the most influential artist of the 20th century, exactly that. Wow, yeah. Just to move away from uh, art, um